go from there. So, um, so this is a slightly different perspective, and than than I think people have heard about before, because I think people think about advanced care planning as a very um, fixed thing. And in reality, it's really, really um, uh, a fluid process. So I want to run through some stuff and then have questions from people. So um, next slide. OK, so as I said, it's really about the conversation. And so I want to talk a little bit about what that conversation looks like and really emphasize that this is about what matters to you and your family. One of the issues that, that, that happens, and Dave had this in one of his slides that he sent me, is that people do an advanced directive. My, my brother, for example, who has Parkinson's, when I asked him about his advanced directive, he says, yeah, yeah, I did it 10 years ago and it's somewhere. And I'm like, okay, Lou, your, your situation has changed. You now have Parkinson's. You might want to look at it again. And he sort of shined me on. But it's really important to recognize that this is very much a fluid process. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I, I put these down because this is something that I stole from um, age-friendly healthcare. And it's really about what you need to be thinking about before you actually do an advanced directive. So first of all, what matters to you? You know, what is important to you? What brings you joy, makes you happy, makes life worth willing, living? What do you worry about? What are some goals you hope to achieve in the next six months? What would make tomorrow a good day for you? And then how do you learn best? That's actually an important question because some of us are able to learn through reading. Some of us are able to look at videos. Some of the, just a whole different way that people can be looking at things. Um, I just went through the death of my sister, and we actually never looked at her fans directive. <laughs> Not once. She she had it. She named who she wanted to make her surrogate decision maker, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But we never looked at it because we had had multiple conversations, not only earlier before she got sick, but during her illness about what, about all these things. So we were able to accomplish it without actually looking at her directive. Um, next slide. And these are some things, that, that, so what matters isn't just about your advanced directive, it's also about your healthcare and what you most wanna focus on. So the Institute for Health Improvement does, everybody's heard about age-friendly healthcare. Um, this is how they have reframed talking about advanced care planning so that it's, that it's not just, do you wanna be resuscitated? Do you wanna have, be on a feeding tube? Do you wanna have all these kinds of things? It's more about what is important to you. What concerns you the most when you think about your healthcare now and in the future? What's the one thing about your healthcare you most wanna focus on so you can do some activity more often or more easily? I can guarantee, and I know that having just been through stuff with my sister, this is not anything that, that providers know how to do. So that's why I'm putting this up here because I think it's up to us as consume, I hate to say as patients, to think about this and bring it to our providers and say, this is what I want to talk about. Really gives us control over our situation, um, which is difficult to do. I will just tell you a quick story. My sister was in the hospital for two nights. Uh, two nights seemed like forever, two nights. Um, and the doctors there, most of whom were very caring and loving, insisted that she get certain tests. And I was like, this has nothing to do with why we're here, nothing to do with what's going on with her. We don't want them. And they just were persistent in, make, in, in getting us to get these tests. And so we, um, my sister finally relented and let them do it, but it was silly. And so having maintaining some kind of control over what matters to you and trying to express it to 
the providers is really important so that you're not getting things that you don't want. Uh, next slide. Okay, there are several guides out there that I really like. Um, one is the Conversation Project, and this started in California. It's out of the Institute for Health Improvement. And you can get on the IHI website and pull up the Conversation Project. And there's a lovely guide in there about talking, how to talk to your doctor, how to talk to your family. It's a little long, in my opinion, but that's. But I think it's also really helpful for people. The other one that I that you'll hear about again is Prepare for Your Care. That's a website that is um, done at UCSF, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Next, next slide. Okay, this is um, the site that I like the most. Just be for a variety of reasons. It came from a lovely woman, Dr. Rebecca Sadari, who's at UCSF. And what she did, oh, probably 10 years ago, maybe, she looked at advanced directives and realized that the language in advanced directives was difficult for people. And, and then she looked at the literacy level of the average literacy level across the United States, which is an eighth grade literacy level. And so she came up with this paradigm of, prepare, of preparing for your care. On their website, they have many educational vi videos for each section. Um, they, they walk you through, they also have a guide of how to talk to your doctor. And then I, if you go into their documents per se, um, they have specific ones for your particular state. So there is a Montana specific document that I helped them put together that you can just print out and use. It looks long, it's about 10, 12 pages, but it's um, really not that long. It, it has five things in it. Um, one is about choosing a medical decision maker, and we'll talk about that in a minute, then deciding what matters most, and then choose flexibility for your decision maker um, then tell others about your wishes and ask the doctors the right questions. Um, and out of that comes this document that you can again get and fill out um, and, and then give to your healthcare provider. It's, it's very, very user-friendly and that's why I, I like it. I'm not a great, as evidenced by my not being able to share my screen, I'm not a great, um, a tech person. So I really like that. At, at Bozeman Health, that's what we're using. I think they're using it um, in some places in Billings. Um, and I know in uh, Missoula, I think some places are using it. Um, ne next. Okay, so again, the conversation project, I talked about this before, similar questions as prepare for your care. There are two brochures that you can download. One is your guide for talking with a healthcare team and the other one is how to talk to your doctor. Um, next slide. Okay, so advanced care documents. And I, I, I guess what I really wanted to emphasize that this really is about the conversation and the end product is an advanced care document. I can tell you this is a very down and dirty presentation. Um, a lot of times when I normally, my presentation around advanced care planning takes a good hour. So you're getting sort of this snapshot of a whole bunch of stuff. <clears throat> so just in terms of language, there are many different advanced care documents out there. I've talked about pre prepare for your care. There's something called five wishes, which a lot of people use. I have, when I tried to fill it out, it, it didn't suit me. It did, I, I couldn't understand some of the things that they were um, looking at. Um, and then there's the generic living will. So a living will really is the same as advanced directives. Um, uh, so when you hear a living will, that means that it is a document, either it's prepare for your care, five wishes, if you go on online, there are many different advanced directives. Um, so you just find what works for you. 
Um, there are some very legal ones out there from the Montana Bar Association. I have some issues with that, but you know, again, it's up to you what works for you. There's also a very specific one out there for dementia care. And some people really like it. Um, I have my own concerns about it because it is very um, proscriptive. In other words, it's very detailed about what you do and don't want. And I think you could probably put it in a more generic advanced directive than one just about uh, dementia. And again, all of this stuff is, it's so fluid as to, as you are actually dying and have a serious illness, all of this is a very fluid process. Um, so what does an advanced care do document do? It appoints a surrogate decision maker. That's really important and, one of the things about a surrogate decision maker is you have to make they, make sure they know that they're a surrogate decision maker. The other thing is that you have to make sure you update it. So I, I would review some advanced directives with patients and they'd have on there their dead spouse. So um, it, it's, again, it's this process, it's a process. You fill out an advanced directive, but make sure you review it. Um, and I can honestly say not to, bad mouth docs, I am one, so I can say what I need to, but they, they don't, they're not gonna push for that. They're not gonna look at it and say, okay, what, is this still appropriate? Um, the other thing advanced care documents do is it, it address, describes broadly your wishes at the end of life. It's a guideline for your surrogate decision maker and family. And I emphasize guideline because I've said it before, as somebody declines and is seriously ill, it's a very fluid situation. And I, I will go back to my sister who, who recently died. She had said to me very clearly many, 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 many times that she would never get a chemotherapy, never. And yet when faced with what ended up being a, a terrible cancer, she was all ready to go for chemotherapy. And, and we would look at each other and, and my, her other people who she talked to about this would look at each other and say, really? But she was all ready to go for, for chemotherapy. So again, it's a guideline. Um, the other thing about advanced care documents, it can only be filled by a competent individual. So it, that's why when you have early Alzheimer's, early dementia, you really need to be filling out these documents then because you don't immediately become incompetent just because you have dementia. So it's really important that you fill it out at that point and have those discussions early on in that particular disease. In the state of Montana, it needs to be witnessed by two individuals. It does not need to be notarized but it, it, it can be, and, and what I would suggest to patients is get it notarized if you think there's gonna be any kind of disagreement in your family. Um, and then you need to discuss and distribute it. So you need to discuss it with your family members or whoever is your, your caregivers or whomever. You need to distribute it to them and to your doctors, your providers. Um, and I will, uh, there was one person I was talking to whose mother had many, many children. And so they were gonna, um, she had appointed her daughter to be her surrogate decision maker, but she actually videoed her discussion um, about that she'd had with her daughter about her advanced directive and then made all of the children listen to it so that everybody knew what was going on. I thought that was actually sort of brilliant. Um, so that ahead of time, she had really prepared for that. Um, next slide. Hey, Dr. V, there's a question in the yeah. chat. It says, um, I think it was on, uh, possibly on this one. Um, how do you find the document you were discussing? You simply go to prepare for your care website 
and there'll be a, a site there that talks about advanced directives and you type in Montana and it'll bring it up. I just shared it out there, the website, doctor. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, it's it's very it's a very easy website. Or I thought it was an for me it was an easy website. And again, there'll be a section about advanced directives, specific advanced directives, and that's how you get it. Um, and, and then there's the pulse. So this is provider order for life sustaining treatment. This was something that was started 20 years ago or 30 years ago in Oregon, and has now spread to different states. It's called different things by different states. So in, in New York, it's called most. In, in Massachusetts, I think it's called most. There's a lot of different acronyms that people have used. In Montana, it's called POLST. Okay, and that's, and it is state specific. Okay, so the POLST is not an advanced directive. And I think that gets very confusing for people. Um, it is, I can't say that enough. It's not an advanced directive and it's not for everyone. It's voluntary and it's really for people with serious illness. So people would say to me, I want this document, I want this document. And, I'm, and I would say, you, you really need to have some reason for having this, not just that you want to, people to know that you do not resuscitate. It, you've got to have something else. You can put that down in your advanced directive. And when, as things change, you can fill out a pulse, but this is not a, this is not where you want to do that if you are healthy and doing well. There were a couple people when I was in practice who were adamant about it and I didn't argue with them. I just filled it out, but it, but it's really not something that everybody should be doing. Um, it's for people with serious illness or or um, people who are old and frail, okay? Well, you may not say they have serious illness, but the, the, many of the older people in their 85 and 90s that I was taking care of were very clear that this was not, that they did not want to be resuscitated, okay? Um, it can be, and I'll talk about that in a minute, can be signed by, uh, by the person, by the patient or a surrogate decision maker. So that's different from an advanced directive. Okay, an advanced directive can only be signed by that person. A pulse can be signed by that person or a family member or a surrogate decision maker. In the, in the state of Montana, if you haven't appointed a surrogate decision maker, there is a hierarchy. So it starts with spouse, goes to children, adult children, goes to siblings, um, and then goes to other kin. Um, and then the other thing about a pulse is it has to be signed by a physician or a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant. Um, <clears throat> An advanced directive does not. Okay, next slide. Okay, so what does a pulse do? It, it establishes a do, do not resuscitate status. It establishes a level of care. So if you look at it, there are three choices. One is do everything. One is, um, I'm trying to remember the language, is uh, some, it's not some care, but it's, it's um, uh, specific, you know, maybe give me an IV, maybe give me, I may want to get into the hospital. And the third one is, is aggressive comfort measures. And that's basically not that you don't want care, but that you want comfort. Okay. Um, and so again, that is not for everyone, um, is for everyone who's on hospice, is for everyone who, um, a lot of home health patients if they're really frail, but it's very different from an advanced directive. Um, so both an advanced directive and a pulse are all part of a clinical context for an individual patient. Um, I think that's the end of my slides and then I can take questions. I think Alan, Alan, Alan is that the end? I think it's the end. Yep, it sure is. Okay, so let me go to chat.
if I can find it, where's the chat? Yep, you have a few. Um... Yeah. Okay. Okay, so. How do you find the document? Yeah, limited interventions is the middle one. And actually on a um, the latest post, I think we changed it to selective interventions. I, I'll have to pull it up. Um, okay, then Eileen, this is a very, very important question that you asked. In the senior living assisted living community I worked in in Wyoming, the state wanted us to have a pulse for each of our residents, kept out in plain sight for first responders in case of emergencies. Okay, that is illegal. Um, that is not the, the nature of a pulse. And I used to have to go through this with our assist. I met with all of our assisted livings here um, and basically said, this is a, they were putting it in their admission package and then requiring people to have it. Um, this is um, a voluntary form, um, has to be talked about with um, uh, the, the person and the provider. So, so it, it's a conversation. So the state can't require everybody to have a pulse. Once they have a pulse, yes, it needs to be in plain sight. But I would, what I would do is, is, or what I did was meet with the assisted living places and talk with them about it. I'm happy to do that, Eileen, if you wanna set up some kind of meeting around that, um, uh, you know, to talk about the, why, why the Pulse is, what the Pulse is and why it's voluntary and a part of a conversation. So let me know, Eileen, if you want that. How is Pulse different from a DNR? Okay. so. Pulsed is an out of hospital, do not resuscitate, also for inpatient. So it goes across all settings. Um, it's just another form of DNR. In the hospital, in the hospital, doctors and providers frequently will write a do not resuscitate order once they've checked that out with the patient and the family. The, the do not resuscitate order um, then has to be translated so that EMS, et cetera, can follow that when somebody's out of the hospital. Um, so uh, that's and um, that's a difference. Okay. Um, then post is far more informative, more than if you want to be resuscitated or not. That's actually absolutely, absolutely correct, Ashley. It does have three sections, and I, I I apologize. I got back two days ago and haven't had a lot of time to look at the document again but there are three sections in it. One is about do not resuscitate. One is the, about the kind of treatment that you want. And the third, I think, Ashley, help me with this. There's a third section um, we, about nutrition and hydration. That's the third section. Um, and uh, so, but again, it's something, it's a conversation to have with you. Um, Okay, so Ashley, actually, um, no, 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 no. It, the, the latest Pulsed, we have gotten rid of blood projects, products. We got rid of, years ago, we got rid of blood products. We got rid of antibiotics because that was a different kind of conversation. So if you are, if that's the one, Ashley, that you're using, I would suggest that you get online and, um, and or call me and I can get you the lit, the the newest update. We years ago we took off blood products and year and and we took off antibiotics because it was a very difficult, confusing conversation to have. So, um, uh, um, what else? Yes, and somebody, Marissa, thank you for putting in the post. You can get it by going to the national organization. You can also type in Montana Pulse. And, um, and get it that way. So. Um, How does this work there to be across state lines, for instance, if we have right. somebody that's southern? Yeah, that's always the question. So that, that's been a big question among the, the national Pulse organization. Right now, 
um, every state has, not every state, most states have their own pulse. So if you go to another state, like if you're a snowbird, snowbird? Anyway, if you, if you go to another state, I always advise my patients to take their advanced directive and their pulse with them and they can fill out their state specific pulse. Um, some pulse require different signatures, some pulse require um, other things. So I just have them take him with them. Um, the adva an advanced directive is um, uh, not state specific. Um, although there are di slightly different requirements about whether things need to be notarized or um, how, how it's witnessed. So I just tell everybody to take them with you and then talk to your provider about what, what do we need to do here. You know, the, the, we put a lot of this on the provider, but actually there's a lot of prep work that a, a nurse or a medical assistant can help with a patient beforehand so the doc can, or provider can just review it. And that's what some of these guides are that I mentioned earlier. Doctor, this is Dave. I've got a question for you. Yeah. Let's go back to the beginning about the conversation and the choices of those different websites and different approaches to this. Let's assume that your sister lived in Montana. Yes. She did not want to have those tests that you were talking about. Where would that information enter into the discussion and where would you memorialize that so that the, at, at the time that person's in the hospital. You, you can't, Dave. That, that, that's what I mean about this being a fluid situation. The, the kind of tests that they were ordering for her, you know, you, can, you cannot, it's really hard to dictate that. You could put that in advanced directive saying something to the effect of, if I'm in the hospital, please don't do unnecessary tests but the docs were convinced that these were necessary tests. <laughs> so, so, so we, you know, we, we, we tried that the docs go on road. It's just what happens and it's not good, but you know, nobody sort of, nobody asked her, do you want these tests? They just ordered them. So you could put in there something like the, to the effect of before you do tests on me, I want to know what they are and a, prove them. You could put that in your advanced directive. Now, whether they would, would, whether they would do that or not is a whole nother question. It is, it is such a fluid situation. And that's the, oh, can the you caveat that, that I say again and again. Sorry, can Dave, put, go ahead. Can you put that type of language in a pulsed? No, that is not in a pulsed. That, a pulsed okay. is very specific. Okay. That, that is in an advanced directive. Got it. Yeah, the, the pulse is very specific and, and you don't, you, there's no space to put that kind of stuff in there. Um, and, and, and it's not something you anticipate. We, you know, we, we went into the hospital as sort of an emergency and it was, as it was unfolding, we thought, oh my God, they're doing all these things. They didn't even ask us about half of the tests they did. <clears throat> you know, they just did them. And you know the first test that my sister got when she was in the emergency room for ten hours was an EKG, a cardiogram. She, there was no reason for her to get a cardiogram. She, it was, but it was, it, it's just what they do. And and so this guy came in to do her cardiogram, and I was like, we don't need that. And he said, well, it was ordered. And so we we didn't, you know, we're you're so vulnerable when you're in that situation that you don't, um, you 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 can't stop this sort of thing that keeps going. We did stop, we did, I had to actually threaten to sort of a, a little bit um, uh, off the track, but I had to threaten to take my sister at AMA to get her out of the hospital. That's so, um, Ashley, you asked if there's a cost. No, there is no cost. Um, um, there's no cost, Ashley, for getting a pulse uh, you just go to call DPHHS and they'll send you 
the updated version plus envelopes. So, yeah. <clears throat> so, Doctor, anyway. you mentioned in your presentation that we change something. When you say we, who makes the decisions about the contents of these documents? Is that in state law or is that? So, so we have a we have a group. We don't change the advanced directives. That's a whole different thing. We're talking specifically about Pulse. Okay. Um, we have a group that reviews the Pulse. The last time we did it was, I think, three years ago. We're probably due to review it again. And we got input from a variety of different places about what works, what doesn't work. And then we reviewed it, agreed upon it, with a bunch of palliative medicine providers. And then we sent it to the national organization for them to review. And then we um, had it redone. With the Board of Medical Examiners is actually the, the where this lives. And so we presented it to the Board of Medical Examiners and said, this is what we would like to do. Um, and they agreed and we presented it to them. So that's, that's how that comes about. And we get guidance from the national organization who also have changed their language a bunch. There's now um, the next step for the Pulse group is to look at the National Pulse organization actually came out with a National Pulse form that has not been adopt adopted yet by Montana, but that's our next step to look at that and see if that's something that we want to do. So that that's that's how that happens, Dave. Any any other questions? So, doctor, oh, go ahead, Dave. I'm just going to ask you, Doctor. The audience for these two sets of documents, the advance uh, directive. Yes. Who's the audience for that that document? Anyone. Okay. Anyone. So so when 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 uh, soldiers go off to war, they're asked to fill out an advance directive. Anyone can have, should and could have an advanced directive, but the key again is to review it. So something you did 10 years ago may not be appropriate now. Right. Um, and and that's, that's the problem. That's one of the problems with advanced directives is they do not get reviewed or discussed. So there's another, another question. No, it, that was pretty much along the same lines of what, our, what I was gonna reference is that case, I don't, I'm losing track of time, six, seven years ago of the, she was probably in her thirties, something had happened to her and she, um, she was yeah, on she life was in. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, yep. so, yeah. So, so Nancy Cruzant, so, and uh, let me back up for a second. So a pulse, as I said, is not for everybody. Advanced directive is for everybody. So, Nancy Cruzan was, this was probably 15 years ago, 12, well, even longer than that, actually. She um, had a cardiac arrest in her 30s um, and was in a persistent vegetative state. And her husband and her parents, and she was on a feeding tube, wanted to stop the feeding tube. And she had no advanced directive in the state of Missouri said, you can't do that. So they went to court and it ended up in the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said that an advanced directive can be anything. It can be written on a piece of paper. It can be a verbal conversation. It turns out she'd had a verbal conversation with some of her close friends who recalled it saying she would never want to be kept alive like this. And um, the Supreme Court said, yeah, as a matter of fact, um, that does hold up. And they also said another really important thing, which was that artificial nutrition and hydration, in the words of feeding tube, was a medical procedure and was not normal care. That changed a whole bunch of stuff. And because um, people were just putting in feeding tubes without permission. And um, that, 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 so that really changed advanced directives and how we looked at it. That was actually back in the 90s, early 90s. So, 
Boy, am I way off five, six, seven years. I know, I know, I know. It, it, I have a great slide of about at her gravestone. I don't have it, but it was um, died when she went into a persistent vegetative state and then finally at rest, I think 10 years later. It's a very powerful one, so. How do you suggest for, for families to start talking about this? I know um, I've worked with organizations before with educating and awareness of the importance of talking about advanced care planning and a lot of people just associate it with older, older age mm -hmm. and whereas it could be even a 20 year old, um, you know, a car accident or something, mm -hmm. so just, just understanding what they, what's important to them. How would so, you start starting those conversations? So, so I think those two things that I referenced at the beginning, the conversation project guide, how to talk about um, advanced directives and, and prepare for your care. Both of those, I think, really help put it into context and are an easy way to try to start having that conversation. Um, you know, in Bozeman, Alana, you know, we're trying to figure out how to do more community education around this. Um, so that people feel safe and okay about having these conversations. You know, there's a big taboo about talking about dying, but, but I think the, the, these, the, both the conversation and prepare for your care, do it in a way that is, let's talk about what matters. I have a, a friend who does a, the, hey, 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 the let's, uh, sorry about about the, the the she calls it the turkey talk and at thanksgiving every year she sits they sit around and talk about you know their their thoughts about if something serious should happen to them about a, a, their advanced directives and she does it every thanksgiving which is fairly hysterical but i i think it's also normalizing it so that everybody can talk about it. But I would suggest that people look at these, um, the, these two guides that are out there and start and see what you're comfortable with. You know, people have to be comfortable with it. And I think as coalitions, and Dave and I have talked about this a little bit, you know, we could really um, do some great community education out there so that people understand this and also can be com more comfortable with having those conversations. Doctor, we have a number of home care providers and administrators of extended care facilities yes. on, on this. What advice do you get, have for them in terms of the populations that they serve as opposed to the direct uh, advice to the families? That's one step removed. So what can they do to ensure that those people that they care for or that they treat actually have the A document uh, in place, advanced directive, or if necessary, a pulse. Because my guess is there's a lot of people out there that simply don't know anything about either of these two sets of documents. So, so um, at least in Bozeman, and I can just speak for Bozeman, um, the nursing homes here and most of the assisted livings are very good about checking about a pulse and checking about advanced directives. Now, having said that, do they re review it? Do they talk with the families about it? I suspect they don't, they just get the documents. Um, I, I'm, I know that at the nursing homes here, um, because we, I've talked with them about it, all of them, all of the patients, almost all of the patients in there have a pulse. Now it gets a little tricky when you have rehab patients who come in because it's it's a different that's a different level of care and those people are not don't necessarily have pulse. We try when people leave the hospital to make sure when they're going to an assistant when they're going to a nursing home that they have those documents. Um, and uh, and actually when you are uh, guys guys. Sorry, I have five dogs at my house. Don't ask. Um, uh, when when guys are asked to when when people come into a nursing home, they have to be asked about their advanced directive. It's 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 a 
federal law. So I think the nursing homes are okay. The assisted livings are a different story and um, I've worked with some of them here. I think it's, you know, educating the assisted livings about these documents and then maybe taking it a step further of, okay, you have the document, um, what do we do about um, uh, actually knowing what it says and having conversations with patients about it? Um, so can anybody so, from Billing speak to what the practices are here in our community opposed to what happens in Bozeman? Are they similar or is it different from anybody's experience? Hi, Millie. Sorry. Yeah, does anybody know? I know Linda, who's not, I, I don't know if Linda's on the call. She's not. Okay. She's not able to join us today. Okay. Uh, has, has worked some with, um, there you go, sweetie. We have my, my sister's 14 year old dog just arrived. So we're, we're coddling her a little bit. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I'd be happy to have conversations with anybody in Billings about this. Um, I'm going to be over at Billings in September for the MHA conference. Um, so if you want to set up something around that or anything, I'd be happy to talk to people. Are there any other questions anybody has? I'm uh, going to send out uh, in the minutes. Uh, Dr. Morganick's com contact information and yeah, the information that she's included, included those two that are up on here. If there are any other questions of her uh, that she can handle today that everybody can benefit from, fine. If you have a question that's more specific and you'd like to talk to her or exchange emails with her, I'll send you that information so that each of you can contact her. And doctor, when are you going to be in, in Billings again? So that we can- So the Montana Health Association, Healthcare Association Conference, I'm giving a talk, I think on the 21st. Yep, it's September 21st to the 24th in Billings at the Doublewood and Northern Hotel, downtown right. Billings, yep. I think it, I'm talking on the 21st, I, 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 you know, it's a blur right now. Hi, Millie. Hi. We're honey. also, Mountain Pacific is also hosting an in-person coalition summit on the 21st from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, at the Double Tree. I always say Doublewood for some reason, but yeah. um, the other thing I was going to ask, and this is more of a prompt because I know you definitely have a very strong opinion of this, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Me? Strong opinion? <laughs> nah. <laughs> Maybe my sister. <laughs> you know, when we when we look across care settings, and I'm thinking about care transitions, care coordination, yes. and you go from hospital to nursing home to home to swing bed to you know to another facility, and maybe somebody mm -hmm. touches at the VA, and so how how can we as a healthcare system do better? What what are some things that we could do in order to be able to see that 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 person has had that conversation? And who would you recommend have those continuous conversations about that? Would it be every single provider that the patient goes to? <laughs> or would you funnel it through just their primary? Oh, God. You know, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think that provider has to take responsibility for it. Um, and they don't. So given that they don't, hi, Millie, given that they don't, um, I, I think um, the family, the family and the patient really need to take control over that and say, here is what this is. Do you have copies of this? And let me just talk about it with you. I, I really, you know, Dave put up a, a uh, get, sent me a slide earlier about um, people not having advanced directives and yet people want to talk about 80% of people when asked want to talk about it, but providers either say they don't have the time or don't do it. So I think this falls on changing doctor's behavior is hard. 
And I um, see Dr. Temporal has his hand raised. Do you want me to unmute hi. Dr. Temporal? Or are you good with them? Oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, no, hi, hey, thanks. This has been a fun presentation. And I was just going to add that I'm sitting on a national work group with, um, I forget the organization, sort of like um, NCQA and looking at uh, yes. clinical quality measures. And um, we're on the cross-cutting quality measure um, work group. And on Tuesday, we were talking about advanced care planning as a cross-specialty uh, cross um, quality metric and whether or not we should make, you know, encourage that as something, you know, across primary care, um, specialty care, et cetera. And the challenge would be that, um, you know, if you saw four different providers, would they all have the same information about what your advanced directives are? And, you know, it, it, and I think that that's, it's like you say, it's important to have that conversation and um, to make sure that the, the information is consistent across your providers. Because if you're like in a, in a single source health system with a common uh, medical record, that's great. But if you updated an information with a community primary care provider who doesn't have that document, you know, uploaded to a system um, thing, changes may not be there or, um, you know, a specialist might be under a different impression than what um, another provider is on and much less, you know, other family members being um, not on the same page necessarily. But it, you know, it is at, at the national conversation about elevating advanced directives to a clinical quality measure. Right, and and which is key. And um, you know, we have this advanced directive code that providers can fill out. Nobody uses it. You know, it's been well documented that people aren't really using it. Um, I will say that when you're in the midst of this, and again, not to go back to my sister, but it's so recent. Um, she had provide we one day we saw seven doctors another day we saw i don't know how many doctors but every single one of them needed to have her repeat that what her advanced directive was and it that was good you know that 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 quantity of life and comfort and and quality of life was more important than quantity of life and and comfort and all this kind of stuff Every single one of them had to go through that with her. And it was sort of funny after a while because I thought to myself, are they, are they talking to each other? This was, the same, this was the same hospital system. This was, you know, and, and, and every single person had to reaffirm what my sister had, must have said half a dozen times to people. So there's that, there's that over, there's also that over asking, particularly in the hospital setting. Um, and it was interesting because within the hospital setting, even though she was seen by the palliative care team, nobody in the hospital setting had her fill, fill out a post. We had to then get it sent to us in the mail from the outpatient palliative care team. So again, all this mixed stuff going on, Michael, that is really, complicated when you're doing uh, taking care of people. It's very complicated to get all this stuff. And that's why I'm, I'm so, so much, so passionate about it being a conversation and that the documents are important, but it's the conversation is what needs to be documented. So anyway, blah, blah, blah. So doctor, what's, what are the three takeaways from today's presentation that you think are important points for those that are participating to hear one more time? Oh, well, it's about the conversation and it's about uh, um, what really matters to you and matters to you if you're seriously ill and matters to you if you're not seriously ill. Um, so what matters to you about your health and, and really, I, so that's one takeaway message. The second is that you, patient and family, and this is hard to do, need to have, know that you are the ones who really have control over what's happening to you. And yes, I have a lot of knowledge. I have a lot of information to give people, but it's really 
cooperating with the patient and family about what's important and not just saying, the doctor saying, you should do this. It's about, let's be partners in this. So really partnering with your provider. And I guess the third thing is, um, it's great to have an advanced directive, but make sure you review it and review it with your provider and with your families. And that's such a missing step in all of, in, in every healthcare setting I've been in is that these documents are there and that becomes a checklist. Check, she's got an advanced directive, that's great, but nobody bothers to look at it except when there's really a critical situation and situations change. So those are my three takeaways. Anybody else have any more questions of Dr. Borgenick? Doctor, I wanna thank you for joining us uh, this morning and the information you provided is very, very helpful. I will send all that information out if you right. and uh, I'll make your offer of being available Please. Well, everybody to contact you and hopefully when you're in Billings, if they would like to sit down and have a chat with you, they can do that as well. That would be great. I, I you know, I, I'm pretty passionate about this stuff. <laughs> I can tell. And uh, care about it a lot. So I, I'm happy to talk to people. So. If there aren't any other questions, we, can, we will adjourn for the day. I want to thank all of you for joining us and we'll see you next month on the fourth Thursday, which I believe is the 26th of September. Thank you all for joining us and thank you for what you do every day to provide care and, and treatment for those in need. And doctor, again, thank you for taking time for your schedule to join us this morning. Absolutely. All right. Take care. Thanks, bye -bye. everybody. Bye-bye.